So, Noel, it sounds like um, big, more practice changing data from the Stampede trial and this, this volume effect it seems to be important then. Uh, yes, I think it, it is important. <clears throat> and I think um, the first thing to say is um, the critical effect of having large data uh, or a large body of data which you can pull in and analyze uh, and then put that together with clinical outcome with different interventions is a very powerful tool. And that has enabled us to do a lot of work, uh, which has been a collective team effort. Um, firstly, uh, we were a little skeptical about the charted volume data because, as Nick has said, we didn't see a heterogeneity of effect. In other words, um, in Stampede, in M0 and in M1, what we saw was the hazard ratios didn't shift, suggesting that you got the treatment and you got the effect. And we saw that also in the Aberatron. So we started with a basic hypothesis, which is if you pull in all the scans and analyze them, then we can see what the effect is on a pre-specified analysis. So in Aberatron, we'd already published on the data. We knew that the M1RT um, component of Stampede uh, was yet to be analyzed. And in the UK, and we weren't able to pull in the Swiss component of these scans for um, logistic reasons, but in the UK, we have a very good system. We were able to get around some of the bureaucratic hurdles and pull in all the scans and analyze them according to specific criteria. And we did a very detailed analysis. We mapped out uh, all of the, uh, the bone scans and the CT scans looking at nodal metastases, bone metastases, uh, met number, and so on. And two very talented research fellows did that, uh, Alex Hoyle, uh, who was a trainee urologist, and uh, Adnan Ali, who was a trainee medical oncologist, uh, did much of the hard work here. And uh, for that, they deserve a lot of credit. Um, and that was quality controlled. It was uh, coordinated through the Stampede team. Uh, what we found, first of all, looking at the, uh, the Stampede uh, M1RT data, is that there is a really critical threshold um, based on four Mets and above. Um, and this, the interesting thing was that this was on classic imaging, which is bone scan CT, which is predictive. So that tells us quite a lot about the biology. And as Nick has just alluded, actually, um, it doesn't really matter what the PSMA scan will show. It doesn't matter whether they had microscopic lymph nodes or not. You got the effect, you got a big hazard, and you got benefit. Uh, and that's fantastic because it, it does really set the tone for how we manage oligometastatic patients. And you might remember that um, in the St. Gallen conference, the APCC consensus, there was really no consensus as, what, as to what oligometastatic meant. Was it bone? Was it lymph node? Was it uh, number? Was it volume? So we've actually got the standard benchmark now, which allows us to go forward. In the aberatron side of things, we were, a, and we did that as a pre-planned analysis in the M1RT, so statistically very valid and predictive. Um, in the aberatron, we were able to do a post hoc analysis using the same rules. And as we, we did with M1RT, we, we looked at charted criteria and we looked at latitude criteria, and perhaps we'll come back to that in, in a minute or two. Um, and what we found was that the effect was pretty much the same. What we also found with aberatron was that if you use charted criteria there were, uh, and not latitude and vice versa, there was an 18% difference in how you classified risk. But overall, they overlapped to the extent that there was only a 2% difference. So in a population sense, it doesn't make any difference how you classify. But in an individual sense, it can make quite a bit of difference. In other words, you might be excluded from treatment using different criteria. And we found again that there was a homogeneous effect uh, when considering aberratro. So, so yeah, the, the uh, classification is, is fundamentally different. And I think as a clinical community internationally, we have to think about how we classify volume and risk and disease burden because they are, there is no standard classification, let's put it that way. So, so they're all prognostic, aren't they? Uh, yeah. but the key thing here, and, and we don't, I'm not sure I believe, if I don't believe, that the charted classification, for want of a better term for it, is predictive of response to chemotherapy. Exactly. So, because the failure free survival effect is the same even in M0, let alone in low volume. But in this case, as you very rightly point out, this is a predictive response as well as a prognostic, um, a predictive response as well as prognostic. And I, uh, and I think the thing that's going to be really important going forward is that in order to reproduce the results, you have to do what you do in the trial. 
So if people start PSMA PET scanning as their default staging, they're going to have to do a bone scan as well in order to apply these criteria. And what they will find, I'm sure, is that they have more than three METs. Um, but it doesn't matter because the, the, the data very clearly show if you've got up to three, four METs, you've got benefit. So I think it, until such time as we can refine METs by doing further trials, and I think it's very important when people do imaging trials that they don't focus on positive and negative predictive values of imaging. They, f they focus on does changing the imaging change the outcome, which is what we've done here. Um, you shouldn't change your practice. You should do what you did in the trial. And I, thi I think the other thing with PET scans is there's a great danger, because we already know that for M0 patients, radiotherapy improves outcomes, that they don't reclassify low volume metastatic patients who have more than three METs on a PET scan. Because they may miss out on, on, on more cures or at least longer term treatment. Because you're depriving them of a treatment which we know works. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a really important point, actually, yeah. because there's a classic uh, uh, Will Rogers effect about to happen. Uh, which is the restaging of patients who don't necessarily need restaging because by all the criteria that we've used in trials which have been based on classical imaging yeah. um, they're going to shift yes. um, and that actually will have an adverse effect and the international community is going to have a problem with this if it doesn't really sit down and think about how to deal with it which is that we don't really know what the natural history of microscopic lymph node disease which shows up with positive PSMA scanning we don't know what the natural history of that is. No. And in the, the lung, M0 lung setting... Lung mets as well. They, absolutely. They, you pop up lung mets yeah. on these scans, that, and we never see virtually lung disease as a problem. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. But. Yeah. So, well, I, what I was going to say was, in those two very large-scale trials, SBCG7 yeah. and PRO7 NCIC PR3, um, which were high-risk localized, clinically localised disease, where there's a clear benefit to ADT and local treatment, um, a number of those must have had PSMA positivity and a high proportion, probably at least 20, even 30% will have had microscopic node positivity. Oh, absolutely. Well, PRO7, it wasn't even mandatory to do a CT scan. No. They were M0 purely on not having bone mets, so they may have had loads of lymph node mets. We, simply, we simply don't know. Uh, and PSA is up to yeah. and above 100 were allowed yeah. in that, uh, that study inclusion. But it's really interesting the idea that you know you, the, the concept behind doing radiotherapy to the local disease in, in metastatic setting is the idea that, a, that the same effect will be right across the spectrum. I, mean, I think that's really interesting, irrespective of the imaging. I think yeah. that's, that's really fascinating, actually.